telemonitoring and case management improve diabetes care. Lessons from the front lines. We are delighted you could join us here today. Our speakers are Jonathan Shackman, who is the Vice President of Analytics and Product Development at AMC Health. Susan Lear, who is the Associate Executive Director of Care Management Program at the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. Gary Welch, who is the Director of Behavioral Medicine Research at Bay State Medical Center. He is also a Research Associate Professor at Tufts University School of Medicine. Full speaker bios are available at corporateresearchgroup.com. Before we get started, we encourage you to submit questions throughout the presentation using the question box on your screen. Our speakers will answer as many as possible at the end of today's webinar. If you encounter any technical difficulties during the webinar, please let us know also using the question box. Without further ado, we now turn to John Shackman. Good afternoon. My name is John Shankman. I'm Vice President of Analytics and Product Development at AMC Health. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. <clears throat> I just want to take a moment to go over the agenda for uh, our discussion over the next hour. Um, I'm going to begin with just a few comments on the whys of telehealth uh, and provide some background on why we're having this discussion to begin with. I'm going to focus on uh, just a few of the more salient uh, predicate studies on the efficacy of telediabetes management. From there, I'm going to pass it on to Susan Lair, who's going to get into the specifics of the, you know, the details and the art of uh, telediabetes management uh, specific to her program, and it really truly is an art. Uh, and from there, we're going to proceed on to Gary Welch, who will uh, present a summary of the findings for the published study. Uh, on this program published uh, recently in the Journal of Managed Care Medicine. Now, we're going to cover quite a lot of information in this short time, so not to worry. We will make this presentation available to you online. And uh, for any questions that uh, we can't get to, if we run out of time, we're going to do our very best to follow up with you uh, and get you those answers. So I'm just going to start, uh, if I can, uh, just a little bit of background on uh, uh, who AMC Health is. Um, AMC Health is a telehealth clearinghouse. Uh, we're not a device manufacturer. We provide a wide portfolio of services and technologies to ensure telehealth program success. Uh, unlike manufacturers, we are, not, we are device and data source agnostic. Uh, we work with clients to identify telehealth impactable cohorts uh, and then marry them to best of breed monitoring technologies. Layered on top of this are wraparound services uh, that include everything from end-to-end -end logistics to patient instruction and patient support, uh, analytics support, uh, as well as clinical services for clients who wish to outsource remote care management to us, either in the short term or in the long term. We uh, have, were founded uh, in 2002. We just, uh, the end of December, celebrated our 10th anniversary, and to date we've had well over 50,000 patients enrolled on our system, and this is across 70 unique implementations around the, uh, the U.S. serving health plans and employers, integrated health systems, independent hospitals, ACOs, IPAs, uh, conductors of clinical trials, uh, and home care agencies. And it's been our distinct pleasure to have worked with uh, the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation since 2006 when the House Calls program, which we're going to discuss, uh, began. Now, before we begin, I think uh, it's both helpful and appropriate to spend a moment on the why. What fuels the hypothesis that telehealth is an effective and necessary element to chronic disease management? And really, it all comes down to a lack of awareness of the clinical facts on the ground. Uh, acute uh, exacerbation mostly occurs outside of clinical scrutiny. Uh, we spend the majority of our $1.7 trillion in this country putting out raging fires, but really these are often preceded by incremental and insidious deterioration whose expression occurs in the home, away from a pair of clinical eyes. And complicating this is that uh, really existing information systems still do not cross boundaries of care settings. The new uh, health information exchanges, the RIOs, and so forth, these are all a great start, but we're not nearly there yet. And even so, existing electronic health records are great at illuminating what was done to patients, the tests ordered, the hospitalizations, uh, the prescriptions written, et cetera but quite lousy at clarifying the outcome. You know, 
Are these uh, are the patients re at reduced risk because of these actions? Are biometrics improving? Are the medications having the right effect? Have all the barriers to compliance been identified and so forth? Um, so really, as a result, care is often duplicated. It's applied too late or in its worst guise, full of gaps, and delivered in the dark, uh, given incomplete clinical information. So telehealth has really um, become the natural answer to many of these questions. Uh, simply put, it's, it's there to make the home uh, the third uh, locus of care after the physician's office and, uh, and the hospital. Now, in terms of uh, the literature, there have been really nearly 2,000 documented studies, pilots, implementations, call them what you will, over the past six years describing the results of remote healthcare services and technology applications around the globe, um, the VA notwithstanding. Uh, the U.S. is very late to this party. Uh, but either way, several hundred uh, uh, of these uh, have been specific to diabetes, the majority showing um, positive outcomes on a number of fronts from everything from uh, A1C improvement to a better blood pressure control to reductions in utilization to greater efficiencies in care management. Only a small percentage truthfully describe well-crafted uh, randomized controlled trials, or RCTs, but even with the best of these studies, uh, really the frustrations are twofold. First, formal studies conduct conducted under uh, optimal conditions shed very little light on real world practice. Uh, often when the study ends and the funding is exhausted, the, the program disappears uh, because they've not really mapped out a, a sustainable working model. Uh, the other problem is that uh, they, they rarely provide, uh, you know, uh, enough information on the craft of telecare management. And by that I mean the nuts and bolts of an effective process. And uh, really they have no interest in this level of detail, but that is exactly the kind of information that our clients demand when seeking to implement a, a remote monitoring program for the first time. And frankly, that's really the unique strength of the study we're going to um, mention my co-presenters will mention uh, in just a moment. Of uh, the many published outcomes, really, uh, in this very little bit of time we have, uh, uh, we have four that I'd like uh, that I think deserve mention. The first is, uh, of course, the United Kingdom's Department of Health Whole System Demonstrator Program. Um, to date, this is the largest uh, randomized controlled telehealth trial in the world. Uh, involved uh, uh, nearly 6,200 patients with uh, diabetes, heart failure, and COPD. The interventions uh, themselves were somewhat varied depending on where in the country they were applied, but basically they describe what we call store and forward processes. And really that means devices were used to take biometric, uh, symptomatic, and behavioral data uh, from the home and push it to a server where it can be retrieved in real time or near real time for case managers to, to act upon. And the results were uh, quite significant. They showed a, a substantial reduction in urgent care visits or what we might call uh, unplanned care uh, and admissions uh, as well as bed days. Uh, but the real shocker was uh, an across the board 45% reduction in mortality. So these outcomes really fueled the, uh, uh, the UK's National Health Service decision to, to make remote monitoring a standard of care across uh, their country. Closer to home uh, and more specific to diabetes uh, is probably the most well-known of the telediabetes studies, and this was Stephen Shea and Justin Starin's uh, iDetail project. Um, or the diabetes education and telecare uh, demonstration. Um, this uh, involved about uh, 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 1,665 Medicare patients in um, underserved areas of suburban and upstate New York. About 400 were involved in the uh, in the implementation. The rest served as a control. The intervention involved, in, involved a, a video conferencing appliance. Uh, this was back in 2006, and uh, biometrics like blood glucose and blood pressure were then also uploaded, uh, and the information was used to improve uh, diabetes literacy. Um, the results were a reduction in mean uh, A1C from 8.4 down to 7.4 uh, compared to just a 0.2 point drop for the controls. And there were concurrent improvements in both uh, cholesterol and blood pressure, which were sustained over five years. Um, there were some shortcomings to the study. Uh, success was really mitigated by several realities. Um, 
quite a few of the folks served in this were already, you could say, in good control, so that overall sort of diluted some of the effects. Um, but more importantly, it, uh, when you go back to 2006, it really described a very cumbersome technology by today's standard. Uh, the, the, the processes have become far more streamlined and far more easy to use. So just so much we can glean from this in terms of relative efficacy. Uh, a more recent study uh, was the VA's Care Coordination Home Telehealth Program, or CCHT. This was a collaboration uh, between the VA's Rehabilitation Outcomes Research Center in, in Florida and Indiana University. It involved uh, 774 uh, U.S. veterans diagnosed with diabetes who were then followed for uh, 48 months. Uh, half of them were randomly assigned to either the intervention or the control. And in the intervention, the patients uh, transmitted daily biometrics um, as well as symptomatic and behavior information via a home telehealth hub appliance. Uh, coordinators, care coordinators then monitored the information to follow up with coaching, with assistance with uh, practitioner appointments and medication management and clinical reminders. Uh, in terms of the results, it was done in several stages, but in both, uh, uh, the intervention group was far less likely to be admitted for inpatient care. Uh, and uh, were consistently more likely to visit outpatient clinics during the entire 48-month follow-up period. And last, uh, I'd like to mention uh, Jose Pagan study. Um, this was done in 2011, and uh, one reason I like, uh, uh, I think this is uh, worth mentioning, is it really describes um, a practical home care application uh, specifically to trying to reduce 30-day readmissions for uh, patients with diabetes. And this looked at uh, retrospective data, 2009 data, from 699 Medicare beneficiaries uh, diagnosed with diabetes who were served by home care agencies in Texas and Louisiana. And they embedded remote monitoring as part of their standard of care. Uh, the retrospective controls were uh, identified through uh, propensity score matching. Um, it implied, uh, employed uh, a technology very similar to the VA study, uh, also home, home telehealth hubs, but um, the patients uh, in the telehealth group had a 12-point uh, uh, lower probability of 30-day readmissions than the control. Now, there are several common themes uh, among these studies and many of the others we don't have time to, to go through that really need to be mentioned. Um, the first is that the technology per se can really never be the focus. This has to be about putting accurate and meaningful information in front of the clinician, regardless of the means of that collection. Uh, information gathering technologies uh, will always be changing and sometimes with great frequency, but information types le uh, far less so. Um, the next point is that uh, information has to be embedded into a proven care management workflow. This must empower the case managers to do what they already do best and help them do it even better uh, and more efficiently. The third point is that data can be strategically utilized to improve disease literacy, and diabetes is especially uh, amenable to this, uh, to this effect. And lastly, uh, data in real or near real time can be used to strategically intervene clinically and drive physician behavior as well as the patient. Um, and whereas with traditional disease management without this technology, the patient and the patient alone was usually the focus. So with that, I'd like to pass it on to Susan Lair, who will tell us uh, a little bit more about the House Calls program. Thank you, John. I'd like to start my discussion with this national call to action from the Institute of Medicine that was published 12 years ago, and at the time was a call to adapt new technologies into healthcare. At the time of this national call to action, I was working in a home care agency trying to implement the use of very simple laptops for field nurses so that the clinical information they gained in the homes could be shared and transmitted in the same day. I encountered tremendous resistance, and I realized that this report spoke to the healthcare industry as a whole, and in many respects, respects, a struggle that continues till today in the adaption of readily available technologies such as telehealth. Um, the new standard of care um, slide references an article by Jaron Lanier about the digital classroom that always brings to my mind the question that so many people ask us about the virtual relationship between our telehealth nurses and their patients in the house call patient program, which is anything but virtual. 
Because while not physically touching our patients, our outcomes demonstrate the very close and highly effective therapeutic relationships that develop between our nurses and our patients. Because through the use of their expert language, use of metaphors, and motivational interviewing, the house call staff have their eyes on the patient's transmitted data on the screen while they use expertise in carefully listening to their patient's hearts and minds. They learn how to partner with their patients to overcome their individual barriers to the behavior change. And as our patients dialogue with the telehealth staff to discuss their data, they're gradually making connections in their own minds between the numbers that our nurses are describing to them and their behaviors, and they gradually experience improved blood sugars as they make the connections in their own minds. So our challenge here was modeling a new paradigm of care, and the House Calls program was born out of very forward-thinking and tech-savvy administrators within the New York City Health and Hospital Corporation. Ann Frisch, the Executive Director of Home Care, and the President of Metro Plus, Dr. Arnold Saperstein, realized that the time was ripe to try a new approach and address the difficulty of improving outcomes within HHC because they realized that if we continued to do the same things we'd always done, they would, we would all continue to get the same results which was unacceptable, and we now have the ability to monitor through telehealth our patients to ensure incredible safety and improved outcomes through very simple technology. So the program facts of our program is that our challenge is to bring a population at the greatest and highest risk into successful self-management despite very limited financial resources on the part of our patients and often limited literacy. Our patients work multiple jobs, have extremely challenging socioeconomic realities that they contend with on a daily basis. We stay connected with this population and teach them how to problem solve in a variety of circumstances that would challenge any of us. The population we serve appreciates the consistency and continuity of care that we provide. It's probably the most convenient service they've ever had, and it's having an impact on their lives through the outcomes that we see. Um, the House Calls program, to implement it, we partnered, we began by partnering with a payer, which is Metro Plus, developing program champions within the insurance company and also within all the facilities that we served. We set a per member per month rate for reimbursement of our services and developed simple user-friendly policies and procedures in collaboration with our facilities and with our payer. We wanted to position our program as an extension of each of the facilities within the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation, which is servicing about 17 different facilities, and we gained access to the electronic medical records within each facility so that we could review the plan of care that the providers were, were outlining. And then our personnel was carefully chosen. We chose experienced RNs and CDEs who were experienced with communication with their patients, and we have ongoing communication training to the telehealth staff because this is a new, a new type of communication over the phone that we needed to enhance our, all of our skills so that we could bring our patients very close to us in a virtual, virtual relationship. Um, building effective relationships with our clinicians throughout the healthcare system was extremely important because we needed to gain the trust of the providers to do the care management that the patients required. So we do, we have done, and we continue to do presentations at all of our participating facil facilities. We encountered in the beginning, of course, when there's any change in the type in the way care is provided, we encountered resistance from some clinicians. And we anticipated that some of our conditions were actually concerned with the, the um, appearance of decreased productivity that they thought might happen when we provided care um, through the telehealth program. That has not happened. As a matter of fact, the opposite has happened because um, through reminder phone calls and consistent communication with our patients, they're missing significantly less appointments than previously, so our clinicians have had probably increased productivity. We examined our workflows so that it would be user-friendly for the clinicians because we understand that our providers are very busy seeing many, many patients, and we wanted to make the workflow very easy for them as well as for our own staff, and the complexity of chronic disease management is a challenge for everyone, so our work with our patients has actually made 
chronic disease management not only have better outcomes but also easier for everyone involved. Um, we developed um, protocols for using our emails and coordinating our care so that it would be strategic and as, as needed for our clinicians and not overburden them with unnecessary communications. The, of course, we identified another barrier that not all our clinicians within our corporation use the same email system um, because some of our facilities have academic affiliations. So we had to address all of those barriers and make sure that we were able to reach the clinicians who are involved in the patient's care. So the things to remember when, de when developing a successful program is um, we, you want to develop a system that you can give your patients consistent feedback because you're modeling consistent behavior for your patients and you're providing them feedback on their readings in real time. That allows them to make the connections between the readings that they get on their glucometers and what you are explaining to them over the phone. So consistency and feedback to your patients as well as your providers to demonstrate the effectiveness of their patients' participation in house calls. And keep your, I say this over and over, but keep your communication strategic when you coordinate with the doctors because you don't want to overwhelm them. And policies to prompt us that um, to make those pre-appointment reminders to your patients, that's embedded in the website that we're using. So we are, are prompted to know when our appointments, our patients have appointments, and when to follow up with those patients. Patient recognition is, I would say, an essential component of any program because despite the value of responding to patients for blood sugars that are high or low, when patients experience normal blood sugars and you recognize them for their success, you're building self-efficacy. And that's an essential, an essential ingredient to, for a person to have in their own capacity to manage their chronic disease. So self-efficacy is built through recognizing their efforts and their success. In developing a to-do list for program development, keep it simple. You can build as you go, but you want to assist each facility to develop customized user-friendly work processes so that they can make referrals to you in, an, in a very simple way. Um, we use email, but you can utilize any process that's, that's easy for your providers. Um, if they don't use email from their facility or the doctor's office, you can use faxes. That We use faxes that come to an e Facts, so it still comes to our computer, so it stays work-friendly for us. We allow our doctors to verify our, the orders through email and return it through our e-faxes, and the patients are called weekly and alerts are responded to within two hours. I think it's an assist to our clinicians that we make reminder appointments, um, reminder calls to our patients before their appointments, and then we review the electronic medical records after their appointments so that we can reinforce their plan of care. And providing that education to patients on a weekly basis and as needed, we use the um, AADE seven essential behaviors for successful di um, diabetic self-management, and our reports are sent to our facilities before each patient appointment so that the doctors and providers can understand what has been happening with their patients before their appointment over the last 30 days. We've learned a lot of valuable lessons over the last six years of running this program, and you can achieve significant clinical as well as financial outcomes. I think this is saving Metro Plus has, has stated and they have reported on the fact that they've achieved financial outcomes by having patients managed in the telehealth program. And you can have very effective patient interactions over the phone. We thought it's hard to imagine having these interactions when you are clinic-based because you only experience the face-to-face -face interaction. But we have demonstrated that you can have very effective interactions and interventions over the phone. And the immediate feedback to our patients combined with supportive services that we, that we obtain for our patients has really had the dramatic impact on their outcomes. So successful chronic disease management doesn't have to be as difficult as it has been previously because this allows us rapid coordination and intervention in timely fashion. And we are achieving sustained behavior change, but this requires ongoing support and reinforcement. And I would dare say a lot of patients on the on the part of clinicians, when you don't achieve it in, within a month, it doesn't mean that it's unachievable. So the expectations for our patients to achieve successful 
self-management without support, I believe, is unrealistic. And at this point, I want to introduce one of our patients who was a diabetic for years. She was in our program and is typical of so many of our patients in that she was never engaged in her care until the House Calls Telehealth program. She agreed to this interview because she felt very strongly that she wanted other people to benefit from the program because it was something that changed her life so profoundly. So I ask you to listen carefully to her words. Doctors and nurses would tell me about diabetes. You can lose a limb or get amputation or you get, you know, infection. All these, yes, I would agree with them, but okay. Walk out the door, I didn't pay you no money. I wasn't following nothing. I was such a denial. I, I didn't want to accept it. It was a good year, couple of years that I, I didn't want to accept it. It was too hard for me. I used to prick my finger, 300, okay, I pricked it, you know. I never used to monitor, I never used to write down how much, uh, the date or the pressure or the how much the blood was. I do that now. They found an interest in me, so I figured, all right, well, let, me, let me put my 50%. And it helped, helped very good because uh, they helped me in one turn, and therefore, you know, I helped them. And I find that my results are better. They find interest in me. I mean, I, I can go to a doctor or a nurse and, okay, they just see me for that day, they tell me what to do that day, but there's not a relationship there. When I do my reading as far as the uh, blood pressure and the sugar, it's connected to the office. They, in turn, which is a good idea, connect with my diabetic doctor. So there's always a communication. If there's a problem, there's always a contact. Either you deal with it or you don't. You want to live longer, you deal with it. And if you don't, you know what the result is. And I don't feel like going any time soon. I hope you enjoyed Yvonne's insights and heard how important it was to her that all of her health care providers were connected and aware of her health needs. The participation in our program had such a profound effect for her, and she was able to reduce her A1C to goal within 18 months on the program. But I think that essentially it all boils down to behavior change, not only for our patients, but for ourselves. So the things I'd like to have you take away from this is thinking about how much practice we all need to feel competent in new skills. And we shouldn't expect our patients to learn new skills in 20 to 10 to 20 minutes in an office visit, they need the same type of practice. And when we think about our own need to continuously update our skills and our knowledge, we recognize the value of this continuing education and support, and our patients are really no different. Chronic, successful chronic disease management is not easy, and I don't think it's right to expect that patients without computers, with low literacy, limited finances, would be able to coordinate their own care between multiple disciplines when it's a challenging thing for clinicians to do. And if you think about sustaining behavior change for clinicians, it's not so different from our patients because we also need to change our management behavior, continuous education and support. So at this time, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Gary Welsh, who will outline the recently published article in the Journal of Managed Care Medicine. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. And thank you, Sam. Um, what I'd like to do in the last six slides is walk through an outline of the results uh, received from, from the study that we wrote up in the paper and talk also about uh, some of the barriers to scaling up, scaling up this type of system, uh, strengths of the program, and close some thoughts on improvements and uh, ways in the future that we could maybe improve this type of telehealth program. The, the first point I'd like to make is this study was carried out by my independent research group at Bay State Medical Center. Uh, we have no financial connections to the hospital or the IT vendors AMC Health in conducting the study or the webinar. We examined the usability and clinical usefulness of the house calls program during approximately two year window of routine program operations. We conducted a retrospective observational analysis of the available clinical data and the remote home monitoring data that was gathered as part of day-to-day -day operations for the program. <clears throat> Eligible patients had an A1C of above 7% with or without comorbid hypertension. 
and had to have been referred into the program by their primary care provider. The patients were a high-risk diabetes group and a selected sample of 330 patients and their providers drawn from a large hospital system. Uh, it's, so it's notable to think that there's considerable scope to expand the health schools program to other patients in the hospital network as there are 1.2 million individuals in the system, around 12% or 144,000 of whom have diabetes. The study is unique in that we present an evaluation of a long-standing diabetes telehealth program with a stable clinical reimbursement model. House Cause is not a research intervention, but a working telehealth program in operation since 2006. Thus, there is much we can potentially learn from House Calls that could be applied to traditional clinic-based diabetes programs across the country that are considering adding a nurse-led telehealth component to improve patient self-management support. Most diabetes care is carried out by the patient on a day-to-day -day basis, so it makes sense that we should develop systems of care that help the patient between scheduled face-to-face -face clinic visits. Turning to the results, looking firstly at the usability of the actual devices in the home, uh, the, the results showed there was regular use of the blood glucose meters and the blood pressure cuffs by the house school patients in their homes. We saw a mean of 38.2 blood glucose meter uploads in the first month and 34.1 in the last month. For blood pressure cuffs, it was 32.7 uploads in the first month and 20.2 in the last month. Turning to blood glucose control, our main outcome, Overall, the 330 house, house calls patients showed a statistically and clinically significant improvement in A1C by the end of the program. A1C dropped by an average of 1.8%, which was highly significant, from a baseline of around 9.8%. We observed that program patients could be naturally separated into four distinct subgroups to help us better understand the real-world clinical value of the program. These four subgroups were created based on the patient's level of participation and engagement in the program over time and their progress towards the program clinical goals of an A1C less than 77%. Group one of these four groups comprised 75 patients who had dropped out voluntarily after receiving weekly nurse telehealth calls for an average of 8.5 months. This group reduced their A1C by an average of 1.4%. Group two comprised 94 patients who had been excluded from the program by the program nurses after an average of 10 months. These reasons included the loss of the landline phone service that was needed for the blood pressure and blood glucose device data upload, a loss of the Metro Plus health plan coverage, a geographical move out of the area, a death for one patient, or non-adherence to the program and use of the monitoring systems. This group reduced the A1C by an average of 1.3%. Group 3 comprised 35 patients who had graduated, as it were, from the program based on achieving satisfactory program clinical goals for blood glucose control consistently over three months. This group reduced the A1C by an average of 3.3%, which was again highly significant. Group 4 comprised 126 patients who had remained in the program for an average of 26 months but who did not achieve target control levels for blood glucose sufficient to warrant graduation status. <clears throat> this group achieved A1C uh, by an average of 1.9%, which again was highly significant. Overall, the above results showed that all four patient subgroups showed consistent use of their home monitoring devices, as well as statistically and clinically significant improvement in blood glucose control. In subsequent analysis, we combined 169 patients who had dropped out from the program or were excluded, that was groups one and two, and we compared these patients with 161 who had either graduated or remained in the program, which was groups three and four. The mean A1C improvement was 1.4% versus 2.2% for this comparison, which was highly significant, showing that uh, the greater engagement of the combined group three and four produced much better results. To put these A1C findings in perspective, the landmark UK prospective diabetes study, the UK PDS, showed that a 1% mean reduction of A1C was associated with a 35% reduction in macrovascular complications, an 18% reduction 
a myocardial infarction and a 17% reduction in all-cause mortality. So with our groups ranging from a 1.3 to a 3.3% uh, drop, uh, we're seeing that this would uh, carry through to some very important um, changes in complication status. Looking at the blood, glu the blood pressure results, our health school study uh, results showed that the blood pressure control was significantly improved for the subset of 196, which is roughly 59% of the total group of diabetes patients who were hypertensive on entry into the program. Systolic and diastolic blood pressure was improved at 3.0 millimeters of mercury and 2.4 millimeters of mercury for systolic and diastolic, respectively. Our subgroup findings suggest that future refinement of the house school program could focus on ways to overcome practical barriers that led to the dropouts or the exclusions from the program in groups one and two. For example, state-of-the-art cellular upload remote home monitor monitoring equipment does not require the use of landline phones that were a feature of the house schools program when the study was conducted. Cellular upload devices could now be offered to all patients. Care management staff could also be alerted to patient dropouts if they were flagged automatically by the telehealth system to enable a structured protocol of patient education to be immediately put in place to allow the patient to make a fully informed decision before exiting the program early. Those patients dropping out for reasons of loss of insurance coverage could be helped with local insurance navigation services or financial planning help. Turning now to some thoughts about scaling up the house calls type of a diabetes telehealth program, while there's a growing application of telehealth programs within the Veterans Affairs healthcare system in the US and also by the National Health Service in the UK, as John mentioned, based on demonstrated clinical value and cost effectiveness. And in this respect, I would recommend uh, a New England Healthcare Institute white paper called Getting to Value that was published uh, last year in June if someone would like a, a nice review of some of these um, the cost effectiveness benefits. Um, but a lack of reimbursement remains the major barrier to wider adoption of telehealth programs like house calls in the US. In particular, Medicare, Medicaid, and commercial insurance payers mostly do not cover telehealth or limit it to rural areas to be delivered by a narrowly defined range of providers, such as physicians or nurse practitioners, but not registered nurses or diabetes educators who are the logical choices to lead these types of diabetes telehealth programs. Also, we need to see an equivalence of payment for virtual to face-to-face -face visits. It is notable that some very progressive legislation has recently been passed by the state of California in 2011, and new legislation has just been introduced into the US Congress at the end of 2012. That was the Telehealth Promotion Act. This provides a comprehensive overhaul of Medicare and Medicaid coverage of remote home monitoring and video conferencing for home care. Other barriers to telehealth besides reimbursement concerns uh, are uh, the licensure and professional liability regulations uh, that prevent providers from providing telehealth services to help patients living in another state. Uh, issue of interoperability from a technical point of view is another significant impediment to telehealth, as are the costs of staff training in the new technologies and systems. I'd like to make a couple of comments about uh, some particular strengths of the house calls program from the patient and provider perspective. It's important that, to note that the house calls is not a carve-out disease management program, but an integral part of the patient's primary care team and treatment plan, and an adjunct to traditional face-to-face -face care. In house calls, the high-risk patients with type 2 diabetes are able to experience regular diabetes education support by telephone as an alternate to face-to-face -face individual or group diabetes education. Clinic attendance requires that the patient organize transportation, planning, and, and cover costs, take time from work, deal with poor weather, plan for childcare coverage and other family responsibilities, cope with any disabilities the patient may have in, in travel. Um, so diabetes telehealth has got some very distinct benefits for the patient. Diabetes telehealth enables clinicians to not only provide timely self-management support for high-risk patients between clinic visits, but also to gather important new clinical information on a day-to-day -day basis from remote home monitoring 
that can aid decision making when the provider does see the patient in the clinic. By contacting patients in their home, own home, we may see fewer patient no-shows and late appointment cancellations that are common amongst Medicaid and safety net patient populations that reduce clinic revenues and frustrate clinicians. If awareness can be raised among patients and providers that diabetes telehealth has tangible benefits for them based on both their positive personal experiences, uh, greater access, and improved clinical outcomes, we can expect a greater demand for telehealth going forward. I'd like to close on the last slide with a few comments about um, improvements as we go forward and some of the ideas for the future. It's certainly true that we'll need to continually refine the guidelines, procedures, and team rules used by the telehealth nurses and providers for receiving, handling, and interpreting telehealth data. In addition, in addition uh, we will need to do some other things, maybe a little bit more uh, creative that are being uh, experimented with out there in, in the U.S. healthcare system, but haven't quite yet been folded into telehealth. One idea is the, to integrate community health workers uh, into the telehealth teams, as they can provide culturally sensitive patient outreach and engagement and reduce the care delivery burden on the telehealth uh, nurse team. We also need to see the routine use of dedicated in-house IT staff for the telehealth programs, uh, so these staff can work closely with the remote home monitoring device vendors to conduct modifications and adjustments to the care delivery features of the telehealth program based on ongoing staff and patient insights. We could also integrate a user-friendly patient portal into house calls, and an example of a, of a, of a, a good working um, user-friendly patient portal is the Cryptic uh, company, K-R-Y-P-T-I-Q. Um, so that patients could not only review their own remote home monitoring data if desired, but they could also request a uh, change in appointments, review their medication lists and instructions, send secure messages to team providers, uh, see a simplified treatment plan, and have access to self-paced education materials. So I think this is one of the ways that uh, house calls type programs could evolve over time. Also, uh, we could integrate patient caregivers into the team model uh, so that they receive appropriate remote home monitoring alerts from the devices if this support was requested by the patient. We could also integrate uh, peer supports, uh, which is uh, referring to other diabetes patients who have successfully mastered the use of remote home monitoring or involvement in telehealth. And we could also leverage social media channels that many patients already use. So all these features could um, over time be folded into this type of uh, hospital-based telehealth program to uh, continue to transform the healthcare um, system. Uh, one of the last points I'd like to make is that um, telehealth, uh, diabetes telehealth, is a very good fit for the, the new trends in medical home and accountable care organizations that are being rolled out in the U.S. healthcare system. Thank you, Gary. Um, we're now going to take this time to uh, time we have left to uh, answer. We have quite a few questions that have come in. Uh, if you bear with us, uh, many of these questions sort of are uh, variations all on the same uh, theme, so we're going to have to pool some of these. Um, we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, again, if we can't uh, get to all of them, we will certainly uh, get back to you as best we can with uh, some of the answers. But uh, we'll start with the first question. Very good questions come in. Um, please explain the telemonitoring process, what equipment was used, how were the results transmitted, and how the results were transmitted to the care management team. Um, I'll start uh, just uh, simply by answering on, on the technical side. With this particular implementation, uh, we kept it very simple. Uh, patients were given a, um, a, an adapter uh, that fit onto their glucometer that uh, would uh, transmit uh, their blood glucose readings uh, to a, uh, a cellular modem. At first, um, in the early iteration of this program, it used to be a landline connected, but we've, over the years, graduated to cellular modems. 
to transmit readings in uh, real time uh, to a server. Uh, for a hypertensive subset, uh, patients were also given uh, just a standard blood pressure cuff that also transmitted readings in real time automatically uh, through the modem up to a server for uh, the care management team to, to review. I'm going to pass it to Susan to answer um, more specifically on how the results were transmitted to the care team. Thanks, John. Um, it's very simple on our end because we have set up a system where all the referrals from the facilities come in to us via email to several people within the intake department who then hand that off after verifying the demographics and insurance information to the nurses who then do an assessment for a medical history and designate the equipment that they would like to be placed into the house. That's all done through the website, so it's very easy by checking off what equipment we want. Then the um, information is transmitted through the website for installation by AMC Health, and as soon as that patient has their equipment installed, then the primary nurse gets the reading immediately to her desktop or her BlackBerry and calls the patient to welcome them and go over our program um, policies and procedures. So that's the short answer. Thank you, Susan. Uh, quite a lot of questions about HD secure video and was it used in this implementation. Um, we at AMC Health have uh, uh, deployed uh, televideo um, uh, as part of our solutions for quite a lot of implementations, specifically for remote, uh, what we call virtual visits uh, in uh, things like um, telepsychiatry or really for cardiac management. But in this particular uh, implementation, uh, televideo was not uh, a component um, of this implementation. Uh, the next question, uh, what was your greatest challenge in implementing the house call program? And again, I'm going to turn this to you, Susan. And just to go back one question about the secure video, the reason why we never used the secure video is that it really was not um, necessary for the management of diabetes or, or hypertension. That The data spoke to us and the patient's picture was in our minds and that's really all we needed and the patient, our pictures were in the patient's minds. So it wasn't necessary and, and in terms of challenges for the program, Whenever you make a change to usual practice, that's the biggest challenge. We needed to basically redefine making a fundamental change in the way things were being done. So we needed to get a buy-in from the facilities to give us referrals. It seems like a win-win, and it is a win-win for everyone. But when you change it, well, you need to get the buy-in, and the buy-in is the, is the biggest obstacle. So... Um, that buy-in is, I would say, is number one, and then number two is establishing consistent communication with all your staff so that, so that you brand yourselves in a very precise and expert communication with your providers. And as anybody who's done branding and staying consistent with your staff, you need to supervise that. So those are the two challenges for, that are, are not insurmountable. Okay. Um, next question is, can uh, this program be adapted to other chronic disease states? And uh, I'll field that just by saying we've had uh, so many successful implementations of um, very similar implementations and by no means restricted to diabetes. Um, so many chronic disease uh, conditions are amenable or what we would call telehealth impactable. Again, this all comes down to information. What is the information that a care manager needs to get from the home and uh, in order to more effectively um, manage chronic illness? And we have deployed similar technologies for everything from uh, CAD, COPD, asthma management, mental health, um, uh, uh, a whole host of cardiac uh, diagnoses, but, uh, and even for post uh, uh, short-term post-hospital discharge, which crosses uh, many, many um, diagnoses. So uh, the answer is yes, it is uh, highly adaptable to, to many different chronic disease states. The next question is, uh, are other program or disease states, uh, it's a similar question, uh, being considered by uh, HHC? And again, Susan, I'll let you answer that. Thank you. We are considering currently hypertension and COPD, implementing that in the near future, and we have started 
um, a heart failure program 18 months ago, and are getting great results from that as well. Great. Okay, the next question. Can you tell us more about uh, the community care workers and how that works with the program? So to that, I'd like to go to you, Gary. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I would have a, my thoughts were really about looking into the future rather than what we're doing currently. At, at Base Aid, with some of the telehealth programs we're working on, these are sort of ideas we're thinking of the role of the community health worker going forward, that they, they could be a very valuable person to be down in the community, understanding the culture and the language and the, the habits and the community they live in, and the type of specific jobs that they could uh, be trained and supervised to do would include uh, outreach and engagement of the patient, which is a critical uh, piece that you need for these types of programs. Um, carrying out surveys, getting them completed that the patient might need to do that helps understand the patient's perspective. Uh, tracking the remote home monitoring data as uh, just to make sure the devices are working and that if they're not, there's someone knocking on the door to, uh, to check in with the patient. Uh, if there is a patient portal tied into this type of system, the, uh, the community health worker could be a proxy for the patient to check and to um, also help with navigation in the healthcare system and make sure they get access to existing social services in the, in the, in the community. And of course, tie in with the, the chronic care team and the caregivers and the uh, visiting nurses that, that are also players in the system. So I'd see this community health worker role as potentially a very valuable one for them to grow into. Terrific, thank you. Next question, how does this work in concert with home care? Who actually visits the home during a house call enrollment? And I'll let Susan let you add to that. This program, um, the house call telehealth program, does not have any nurses that go in to visit. If we need a nurse to go in, we then make a referral to home care and coordinate with the home care nurse on what her findings are, and we help her to understand when we're getting data that's transmitted. Our records, our transmitted data goes into the home care records for the period of time that home care is in the house, and we communicate regularly with the home care nurse. But we do not make any visits to the, to the patients. 95% of our patients have no home care involved whatsoever. Okay, the next question uh, deals with uh, physician involvement. Uh, what exactly is the role that the physician plays in this directly? Uh, do they need to be licensed in the same state, et cetera? Um, how uh, has telehealth uh, served as a, a way to triage uh, information for uh, uh, physicians? And uh, uh, do they receive uh, 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 how how have the physicians uh, uh, received uh, the telehealth program? Again, Susan, I'll let you answer that. I think I spoke earlier in the presentation about the initial resistance. However, the patients who are in the program are, are achieving such remarkable outcomes that the that the physicians have been largely won over. Um, we still have physicians who don't have time to answer as many emails as we would like, but on a, as a whole, when we do our presentations and visit, they are very pleased with the program. Their direct involvement is communicating directly with us, and sometimes they call the patients directly if, if, need, if the need arises. They could schedule patients for emergent visits in between their regularly scheduled visits, or they call in prescriptions for medications that have run out, and instead of finding out three months later that their medications ran out, they find out within the same few days and we're able to get much greater adherence to the medications. So we don't use any clinicians that are licensed outside the state. Um, I don't have an answer to that. All of our clinicians are within the New York City health and hospital system. But at presently, physicians are very engaged in the process because it's giving them much better outcomes and when paper performance is is looming in the distance, our clinicians are realizing that this is going to help them. Great. Um, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about uh, the Affordable Care Act and how Obamacare has uh, had an impact, if anything, on telehealth um, and uh, specifically how uh, ACOs are changing the industry? So for this, Gary, I'll turn to you. Uh, the couple of comments over there, John, is that I think it's uh, quite an exciting time for telehealth in that the, the Accountable Care Act has a provision. The first part of the act is really trying to close the insurance pool so we have a sane uh, pool of everybody, uh, every individual is in the pool. 
um, which is a comparable to other countries, uh, developed countries. They, they have a, like a national pool, insurance pool. But the second part of Obamacare is really the exciting piece, where you bring together a local network of providers and clinics and hospitals into an integrated network that shares the care and shares the, uh, the quality risk and also the financial risk. And so one of the great benefits of that is that a lot of money that we spend in America is on uh, treating people too late especially around chronic medical conditions. And for example, diabetes is a classic case of a disease that if it's poorly managed by the patient in the healthcare system, the, the patient will end up in the hospital and with the emergency room with a lot of specialist services which are, could have been prevented and are very expensive. So if we start to have these accountable care organizations formed, then there will be payment incentives to prevent uh, a lot of the problems from occurring. And telehealth is really going to be part of the glue that helps um, uh, the providers and the, the clinics to, to actually manage the patient on a day-to-day -day basis so that we can prevent these expensive emergency room and hospital events. So I think uh, Accountable Care Act is really uh, good news for us because it aligns telehealth with the, the public health needs we have around chronic illness uh, in America and prevention of uh, costly complications. Great, thank you. Um, the next question: Does the same care coordinator call the same patient each time, and how do you how do you handle coverage when the nurse is out uh, out sick? And Susan, I'll let you handle that. Thanks. Um, as each of our patients enter the program, they're assigned to a primary nurse, and those nurses call the patients each week. Their website has a drop down under each care manager's name so it's very easy to manage and when anyone is out sick or on vacation that list which is a drop down with the patients all listed under that nurse's name are easy to cover by the team and we have a team approach to our care. Although the same nurses do call the same patients weekly unless they're not in. All right, we have uh, uh, just, um, time to take maybe one or two more questions. What percentages of patients are fully engaged in telehealth program in the first 90 days? I haven't tracked that information exactly. Um, if I was doing an educated guesstimate, I would say that 75 to 80 percent of our patients are fully engaged and are very appreciative. The challenge is maintaining that consistency over the next few months and if we then achieve that we've basically um, achieved our goals. Okay just one more question. Um, did the program require significant capital investment on part of HHC? Susan? No we didn't we don't purchase equipment so I think that most programs the capital investment is in equipment. Um, we utilize nurses who are currently in HHC and it added nurses as our population, uh, patient population grew. So we've added nurses as needed. So I don't think this was a huge capital investment. We repurposed some nurses who were doing other things and then we added as we, as we went. So because we were on a pay for, pay for patient per month, we were able to meet our costs. Great. I'm afraid uh, we've uh, run out of time. Uh, there were some more questions, and we're going to get those answers to you as best we can. And with that, I want to, uh, on behalf of my colleagues here, thank you so much for taking the time this afternoon. Uh, and uh, with that, I'll turn it to you, Allison. Thank you so much to John, Sue, and Gary for that very valuable presentation, and thank you to all the attendees for taking the time to listen in today. Have a great day, everyone.